It is Thursday, January 25th, and we're going to have a pack show for you this afternoon. So a couple guests, we're talking about environmental and public health. We're talking about animal welfare and new legislation popping up in the legislator. And then we're having a comedian come on. You might recognize the name, Christopher Titus. So looking forward to having him in studio later on this afternoon. He has a show popping up at the Comedy Connection. So looking forward to an exciting show this afternoon. All right, so I'd like to say hello and welcome my first guest, uh, Professor Joe Braun. He's an assistant professor of public health and epidemiology at Brown University. And recently he was named one of 20 pioneers under 40 in environmental public health by the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Joe, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Molly. So really looking forward to having this conversation. You and I have been chatting for a little while, and so it, it took some time to get you in studio today, but uh, we finally nailed you down. So excited to have you here. Um, talk to us a little bit about, uh, before we dive in onto this recognition, first of all, I should say congratulations. Thank you. Um, but talk to us just a little bit about what you do, because you have been involved in research for quite some time now, uh, and you've published, um, you've You've been published many times, but just to get us started, tell us a little bit about what you do. Sure. So we have been following uh, groups of pregnant women or children from early in life and then following them um, until they're older children and seeing how environmental chemical exposures either during pregnancy, infancy, or childhood influence children's health and development. And my research is really focused on children's neurodevelopment, so their brain development, and looking to see if environmental chemical exposures increase the risk of uh, developmental disorders like ADHD or autism and then we're also we've been looking at how environmental chemicals influence the risk of obesity and if ch um, as well as cardiometabolic function so things like ch uh, children's metabolism of glucose and lipids so we've been doing this in a couple of different studies one in Cincinnati Ohio uh, another uh, multi-site study in Canada and then recently we uh, have gotten some funding to do this in a group of children up in Boston Massachusetts oh wow so the work keeps continuing. Um, it's really interesting, like you just mentioned, you've done research and you've done these studies in multiple locations throughout not only our country, but in Mexico as well. Um, I find this interesting. How did you get involved doing this? How did this become your, your path? So I, I, a lot of people in public health sort of take this, this convoluted path to reach where, how they, to, to reach the, the final destination. And for me, it started as an undergraduate um, in biochemistry and being very interested in science as a, as a student in, in high school. And um, what I found though was that mixing, working in a lab and mixing liquids in little tubes and, and working with animals was, was fun and the science was really important, but that the questions didn't seem, that we were trying to answer didn't seem directly relevant to human health. And so we were always one step away. And so I got really excited about um, public health and epidemiology when I went into um, nursing school after I had done a, uh, worked in a lab for a while. And it was there that I worked with a professor um, doing some epidemiological studies and really getting excited about children's health because of, of her work. And that's what led me to really find this passion for epidemiology and for children's environmental health. And, and from there, I pursued a doctoral degree in, in epidemiology from UNC and then did some additional training in environmental health up at the Harvard School of Public Health. What I think is so fascinating is how much of your work has been published and how much you really have found. And so we'll dive into a little bit of that. Um, let's talk about your recognition. So whether you want to or not, you have been recognized, which I think is so fascinating. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this. Um, the environmental public health has recognized you as one of 20 pioneers under 40 in environmental public health. Uh, what stood out to you about that? What did that mean to you? It was great to be recognized for, for being a, an innovator and, and, and leader in this and, and to be moving, moving the field forward. And you know, I'm, I'm recognized along with a lot of other people who are doing great work in this field in a lot of different disciplines, um, not just in, in, in um, studying epidemiology, but people doing laboratory sciences as well. And I think that's it, everyone's doing really exciting work to move this field forward. And it's, it's just really an honor to have that recognized. Let's talk about some of the work that you have done, um, because basically when you when you break it down to the most basic, basic element, what you're studying is how uh, chemicals or environmental chemicals can affect people and their health. And you look at infants, children in their infancy, uh, and pregnant women can be affected. Um, what are some things that you have found that have stood out to you? 
So we were among some of the things that we found that have been most interesting have that been that we have seen that the, the chemical bisphenol A, um, which is used in some polycarbonate plastics, as well as a, a, a lining inside of food cans, we found that exposure to that during pregnancy is associated with behavior problems in children, specifically girls in one of our cohorts. Um, and we've seen now in some more recent publications that this association between bisphenol A and um, poor behaviors in these girls persists out until the girls are eight years old. Wow. So we've been, um, this has been the real strength of using these studies where we follow children for long, a long period of time is we can see do these associations persist as children age and reach school age. And that's really an important age when we study kids because we know that a lot of these behavioral traits and other things like um, cognitive abilities and their ability to learn and remember really solidify and crystallize in those years. So we, we think that it, 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 those um, associations we see will probably persist into later, later life. So when you're doing these studies, are, do people, are they knowingly involved in them and they're no, being knowingly exposed to them? Or are these things that we're just exposed to every day? All of us are exposed to almost all of these chemicals. You know, if, if we measured, uh, took blood or urine from you and I right here, we would find uh, uh, measurable levels of a lot of these chemicals. And so we're really taking advantage of just natural variation in people's exposure. The fact that you eat canned food today and, or you eat more canned food than I do, and then we can see that you have more bisphenol A in your urine than I do. And so we take advantage of these sorts of things. Um, you know, the, the real um, difficulty in doing the studies of these environmental chemicals is that we can't expose people to these chemicals intentionally. So if we can't do that, it's not ethical to do that because we're worried about the health effects they could have. So we really rely on observational epidemiology and observational science where we are studying how people, um, people's natural variation in this exposure is related to health. What do you think you are most proud of when you look at your body of work? Because you have looked at how things have progressed over the past few years and your body of work and, and the <laughs> research has made a difference in, in some people's lives. Uh, what do you think you're most proud of? So the thing that I, I, I would, I think one of the things I'm really proud of is the work we did on bisphenol A where we were the first human study, the first study to, to look at the effects of bisphenol A on children's neurodevelopment in humans. And we followed this work up with a series of studies looking at what were sources of bisphenol A in pregnant women and their children. And so we've not only just looked at whether or not bisphenol A has adverse health effects, but we've also looked to see what are the sources of exposure and what could people do to reduce their exposure. Because it's one thing to just say that the exposure is bad, it's another thing to be able to give people the power to change their exposure by, by modifying their behavior. So we found in, in one of our studies that consumption of canned vegetables was associated with higher levels of BPA in women's urine during pregnancy and this is good information for them because it gives people the opportunity to change their behavior and possibly reduce their exposure and maybe improve their health in the long run. Um, we also published some studies looking at the relationship between BPA exposure and kids risk of obesity. In that case we did not find an association and found that uh, it didn't seem that bisphenol A exposures affected children's uh, adiposity or, or risk of obesity. Um, but again it was part of this comprehensive uh, uh, number of studies we did on, on this exposure and really trying to figure out if, if and how it affected kids health. Have, have you been, I mean when you're looking at the body of research and the body of work you really can't be biased, right? You really have to go in with an objective mindset. Is it hard to do that when you're looking at chemicals and you're looking at people? Yeah, I think it, it is hard because there's there's this tension because there's a lot um, there's a lot riding on some of this in that you know there's different interests in, in what what is said about these chemicals in terms of their toxicity right there's the manufacturers of them who are concerned about their profits and what happened what how their chemical is labeled BPA is a great example of this where you know you saw a lot of people uh, marketing BPA free uh, baby bottles and other products. Um, and then on the other side, there's a lot of public health advocates who really would like to see these chemicals be reduced, exposure to these chemicals be reduced, and, and justifiably so in many cases. But there, there is that, that tension, and it is, it is, it's a fine line to walk and stay in the middle and try to be objective. And, and I think that's, that's a challenge as a scientist. But at the same time, I think you know, the scientists now, we have, a, we have a real obligation to make sure that our work is translated in a meaningful way so that it benefits the public. I think so too. I think that's a great way to put it. Um, let's talk a little bit more. So uh, because of this recognition, being a pioneer, 20 under 40, uh, you are giving a webinar address coming up on February 6th. So if people are interested in kind of tuning in, what will you be talking about? 
So I'm going to be talking about some of our more recent work where we've been looking at a different um, chemical, in this case it's a set of chemicals called perfluoroalkyl substances. These are a class of persistent chemicals that we find in um, textiles um, and they're, as well as firefighting foams and some and industrial products. And they're used to repel water and stains. Um, so if you use products like Gore-Tex, um, oh, it's used yeah. to manufacture the Gore-Tex that's put onto clothes or textiles to repel water and stains. Um, so we've been these chemicals persist for a long time in the environment and there's some animal studies showing that they may affect the growth and development of, of the fetus and child and we published some work in the last few years showing that exposure to these chemicals early in and during the prenatal period was associated with alterations in the way children grew and, and gained fat mass. Um, so these children seem to be becoming children with a higher exposure in utero seem to be getting um, more fat mass more quickly than their peers who had lower exposure. So we've been um, following that up with a new study, uh, with a new follow-up in our study in Cincinnati and, and doing new visits with these children at 12 years of age and doing very detailed measurements of their body composition, looking at how much fat do they have, uh, as well as where is that fat? Is it more in their abdomen, which is what we worry about for things like cardiovascular disease risk, versus is it more in their legs and butt? Um, we've also, we're gonna measure lipids and glucose in their blood, and then look at things like blood pressure. And then my colleagues at, at Cincinnati were, were fortunate enough to get another grant and were able to do uh, brain imaging of the children as well. So we're looking to see if some of these neurobehavioral things we've seen in previous studies uh, coincide with changes in the in brain development that we can see using magnetic resonance imaging. Wow. I mean, that is, that's fascinating and slightly troubling to think, but also good that you are doing this research and doing this work. So does it matter the amount when you're looking into this? Are you looking at the amount of exposure that they received? I mean, it is it, like, where do you... What are you looking into when it comes into the amount of exposure? So we measure, in this case, this, this, these, these perfluoroalkyl substances we measure in blood. And, and that's a pretty good marker of it because they have, um, in, in our, these, these chemicals, unfortunately, hang around in our, uh, in our bodies for about three to five years. Wow. So the exposure we have today is really a reflection of all of the exposures we had you know, for years before this. Um, and so we've been, we've been looking at measuring that both in the pregnant women and then we have measured these exposures in the kids several times as they grow up and, and will again at this new 12 year, when, at this new visit when they're 12 years old. Okay. So I'm curious, I, I told you before we were coming on that I'm not going to go down any wormholes like, oh, well, what then what do we eat? What do we drink? What do we breathe? You know, there's chemicals everywhere, right? You know, I told you I wasn't going to do that. But if people are listening to this conversation, they're thinking, oh my goodness, okay, so if you can link things possibly to uh, development and to obesity and, you know, da, 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 whatever. Um, what can we do if we're interested in hopefully preventing some type of exposure and reducing risks? So I, it's a great question, and I think you know this, and I'm happy to answer it because I think it's there's not an easy answer, um, and and it's it's one of these it's one of these things where I think there are things we can do as individuals to reduce exposure, but we really rely on policymakers and regulators to protect us in this case because for a lot of these things, unless you you know unless you avoid all contact with modern society, you're not gonna <laughs> you're not gonna be able to reduce your exposure to all of these things. So I think the 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 best thing the the way I what I usually tell people is you know if you're concerned about these things is you can eat organic foods to avoid pesticides. You can try to, um, you can use glass and not plastic to store and reheat your foods. Try to buy things that aren't in cans, but the balance there is of course there's healthy things in cans, yeah. right? You know, everyone likes to make chili and that you need tomatoes and beans and it's much more convenient to buy your cans of beans and, chili and, and, and tomatoes than to like rehydrate beans and that sort of thing. And right, and you know, so I'm guilty of using canned beans as well once in a while, but you know, it's, if you want to reduce exposure, that's a really big source of exposure is canned foods. Um, so, you know, and then for other things like some things in personal care products, you can try to use certain brands that don't use parabens or phthalates in them um, or reduce your use of personal care products if that's something you can do. And so there's certain steps individuals can take, but it's a lot of things. And I think that's sort of the balance, that's, that's where we sort of get into this question of, well, you know, how much burden should it be on the person to reduce their exposure with all of these behavioral changes they have to make? I think the nice thing is that over the last few years, manufacturers and, and companies have seen this um, the, the slew of studies coming out from my, myself and colleagues showing that there could be potential health effects of these chemical exposures, and they've said, let's avoid using them. So Walmart recently, uh, and a few years ago, announced that they would ban certain chemicals from some products being sold in their stores. People have switched to BPA-free, uh, not using BPA in some of these, um, in baby bottles and, and other plastics. but. Um, 
we run into this, this game we play called the chemical whack-a-mole game. So we get rid of one chemical, like BPA, and then three new ones new spring ones up, up, and we don't know anything about these three new ones. And so then we've got to figure out, well, are we exposed to these? If we're exposed, how much? Is there a bad health effect of them? And that's really challenging. Um, and, it's, and it's usually left to, sci to scientists like myself or government-funded scientists to figure this thing out because there's not a good regulatory framework for dealing with these things and figuring out when these new chemicals enter the marketplace, are they, are they harmful for human health? So are we looking at when it comes to, and I always wonder this, when we're, when we're heating up products or reheating products, do we just need to avoid plastic altogether as glass or some other type of cooking mechanism, just a safer bet? I think, I think if you want to be safe, glass is good. You know, I, I use it in my house, um, you know, and I think that's, that's reasonable. Of course, you know, there's reasons not to use it. If you've got lots of little kids running around, it might not be a great <laughs> idea to have lots of glass, glass around. But you know, it's, I think, I think that's a, a pretty safe, that's a pretty safe thing to do. You know, I also think it's a little, it can be a little better on the environment because some of this plastic stuff we just turn over more and just from the standpoint that we put in the landfills more and, or it doesn't get recycled and so glass tends to last a little longer. That's true. You think about these products where you can just throw like microwavable food in the plastic bag and I always think like, just start thinking maybe I don't want to be cooking my rice or vegetables in plastic. Right? Well, and I think I think it's it's in me and you know there's a whole other movement about the you know the slow food movement right you know just sort of slowing down and not always focusing on making things as quickly as possible and as conveniently as possible but making them good uh, and taking your time to do it. Lots of good thoughts in that. Um, so as we kind of wrap up here, you talked to us a little bit about what your webinar will be about. Um, what research do you have in the mix right now? You talked a little bit about the, the links to obesity study and that. Do you have anything else groundbreaking and exciting? <laughs> yeah, so one of the really new exciting things that we're doing with this, with this study up in Boston is we're gonna start looking at how mothers and fathers' exposure to some of these chemicals before they get pregnant might influence their children's oh, health. Wow. So we're really getting interested in the, what we're calling preconception exposure. So um, thinking about could some exposures to chemicals or other factors that um, impact our uh, either sperm or eggs in the dad and mom respectively, could those have an effect on children's health later on in life? And so we had some com some pretty interesting preliminary data that suggested it mu there might be some something there. And so we've been pursuing it now in this new cohort where we've been able to measure exposure to some chemicals in moms and dads. And I think the other really exciting piece about this is the dads. We've, we've long, in this field, we, it's either been the pregnant women or the kids, and we have really neglected dads. You know, they contribute a lot more than just, um, than just their conception. They're, you know, they're there throughout life, and, and some of their exposures might matter too. That is fascinating. Well, I look forward to having you come back. We have lots more to talk about. We do. Thank uh, you. I'm so excited. Thank you, and congratulations once again, Professor Joe Braun uh, with Brown University. Congratulations on your recognition. Thank you so much for joining us here today on live. I appreciate it. Uh, everyone, I hope you hang tight here on Go Local Live as we get set up here for our next guest.